Sounds like Kim's having a bit of uh, technical difficulty here. Well, everybody, we're on hold. Kim will be with us to start the conversation shortly. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Classroom 2.0 live session today. We're so glad that you joined us. I'm Kim Case, and I'm pleased to co-host today with Lorna Costantini. Normally, Peggy George is with us, but today she's near Glacier Park in Montana. She's at a family reunion in her hometown, and I'm sure that she um, she's taking lots of pictures on her iPhone, and that if you're a member of her Facebook page, you'll be able to see those pictures shortly when she gets back into town. We're going to be talking today about Illuminate and the very special features that you can use in your classroom. And these can also be used um, on interactive whiteboards or in other distance learning platforms. And we have our very special guest, Tammy Moore, who normally does our closed captioning features, and we're very excited that she's with us today. Each week at the same time, we gather to discuss technology tools. Our broadcast consists of a one-hour session that is recorded. The link to the full video, audio recording, and our chat log is posted at the Classroom 2.0 live site at live.classroom20.com. The topic each week is posted on the Classroom 2.0 live site so that you can be prepared with links, ideas, and tools that you'd like to share, and a newbie question of the week that's pre-announced so you can bring some possible ideas or answers or solutions to share with everybody. We're using the new setup in Illuminate, and so I'm going to go ahead and review some of those features today. During today's sessions, we'll be asking some poll questions. And to cast your vote, you will use the check mark and the red X. And those have been moved to a different location. Those are next to the um, emoticons. Below the participant window is a hand with a little green arrow on it. And if you'd like to ask a question or share something, during that time at the end of this session, please raise your hand and then you'll be given the ability to use the microphone to speak. Next to the hand are two emoticons, the applause symbol and a thumbs down symbol. In the far right, <coughs> oh, excuse me, are the polling um, options. And in the very far right is the blue door. If you need to step away from your computer, please click on the blue door and then we'll know that you're not available at that time. Below those symbols is the chat window. If you'd like to send a message to the room, you'd type your, win your message and then you would click the send that button. To send this message to the room, make sure the words this room is visible. And if you wanted to send a message to a specific person or moderator, you would use the drop down arrow to make your selection. Moderators are able to see all messages throughout the session, so keep that in mind when sending messages. In the bottom left is the button to activate your mic. You'll click on the mic to begin speaking, and be sure to click your mic when you're finished speaking to deactivate your mic. It's similar to a, uh, a walkie-talkie. If you can't see the chat, the whiteboard, or you'd like to resize the different windows, you can change the session layout. You would click on View in the top menu. Sometimes the layout is locked by default, so you may need to unlock that feature. You can then select the desired layout of the options that they have shown on the right, or drag the individual windows and resize them to fit your screen or to fit your preferences.
Today we'll be using um, one of the laser pointer of the whiteboard tools and we'll be using that to show our lo location and the laser pointer is the little wand with the blue um, the blue wand with the red starburst at the end and we're going to do that now if you could please click on the laser pointer and then indicate your location on the world map I'm seeing lots of places in the United States and lots of Canada places. And Europe, Asia. And we're so glad that you joined us today. And that you've taken time out from your Saturday to be with us. And it's exciting to see where everybody is located. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and move on to the polling questions. And as you can see, that <clears throat> there are several different options. We're going to be using the check mark and the red X next to the blue door. There will also be times when we'll be using the ABCDE, and that will be also located by the blue door. So let's move on to the first question. And the first question is, do you host online meeting or training sessions that you would use interactive clip art or content? If you use interactive clip art or interactive content that you host in online meetings, if you would please click the green check. If you do not host online meeting or training sessions that you use the interactive content, click the red X. I'll give everybody a, sec a few seconds to vote since the polling options have moved. Some people say that the polling options are a bit easier to find down by the blue door. Good, I, I'm hoping that that's the case. So let me go ahead and get the results. Okay, about 64% of the group do not use interactive content in hosted online training sessions. And about 17% do. So let's go ahead and let's go to the next question. And let me clear the responses. And the next question is, do you create your own interactive clip art for use with students, whether it's any age, any platform, or just for use on an interactive whiteboard? Do you create your own interactive clip art? Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to vote. Okay, a large majority do not. 67% of the group do not. And 17% of this group do. So hopefully by the end of the session, if we were to take this poll again, it would change. And what we're going to talk about today are interactive clip art and clip art collections that are for use in Illuminate, but you can also use these and just and take the concepts in different learning platforms online as well as adapt them for use in using them with an interactive whiteboard. So now I'm going to pass the mic 
to Lorna, who's going to introduce our very, very special guest today, Tammy, uh, who is Tammy Moore. So, Lorna, I pass the mic to you. Thanks very much, Kim. Uh, I, I want to repeat for the people who are in the in the session today that Tammy Moore has actually been with us for quite a while doing the closed captions, so she's not at all new to uh, Classroom 2 Live, and uh, we're very grateful that she's been doing this work for us. It's been a great advantage, and um, now she's coming live with us today, and we're going to be addressing, as Kim just said, what are Illuminate clip art collections and how do we use them, and I was one of those people that did the X. So this is I'm a really newbie and uh, looking forward to Tammy um, uh, extending our education and using Illuminate. I want to talk somewhat of what I know about Tammy and that you can find her at the Virtual Home School Group where she uh, uses Illuminate daily, uh, teaching with Moodle and uh, a variety of different subjects, biology, chemistry, and physics. But specifically, she has a background in illustration and, and portraiture, and it gives her some great, fun, interactive ideas for using the, the whiteboard. So we are um, going to turn this over to Tammy. To, could you tell us more than I already know about you, Tammy? Give us a, um, a sense of uh, your background and you know I'm going to ask you to lead right into uh, your presentation about using Illuminate clip art. So welcome Tammy and, and it's your turn to take the mic. All righty. Well you've gotten really there's I, I've it's not like I've got a ton of interesting things in my background other than just the fact that I'm an incredibly visual spatial person and I think you'll probably find in the participants and student body that you work with that you probably have a lot of visual spatial students as well. And I don't know about everyone else but I found it was really difficult during my school years because my weakest learning style was auditory and because that's the most efficient and the easiest to do without technology, that's usually was what was used to get content ac across. And in a sense what I had to do because I was so strongly visual and spatial is I had to constantly interpret what, what the teacher was telling me and I actually had to translate it into something visual. It wasn't at all uncommon to see me in a classroom with a piece of paper and at the end of the lecture instead of having a lot of words on my paper I had all these little scribbles and, and drawings. Now I suppose if the teacher ever were to walk around and take a look at my notes they probably would have thought I wasn't paying attention and just doodling the whole time. But if they'd give me a chance to explain, I could have told them about each of the images and how it related to what they said. Because I could remember, if it's something that I interacted with by drawing, that's that spatial side of things, and it was something I could turn into something visual, then I could remember it. And my family, it's hilarious, they know me so well. If, for instance, during the week where we run out of toothpaste or we run out of something, they don't just walk up to me and tell me, Mom, we need more toothpaste or we need more pineapple or whatever. Whatever. They actually will bring me the container and, and put it right in front of my face because if I see it, I'll remember it. And they also know that if, if I set, all my friends know that if we set some sort of a date for something to do together, they'll say, okay, go write it on your calendar because I've got to see it. And a lot of kids are exactly that way. So if you can take what you're doing with your students and provide something that they can see, and then even more, you get those spatial kids and you give them something that they can interact with, they're going to remember the content a tremendous amount better. So that's really what I want to do is I want to show you that the technology has evolved to the place where you've got the tools now where you can make stuff that's interactive and visual and get those kids in there, especially you'll find the ones that are, are leaning toward the ADD, the ones that are hard to hold their attention. You give them something where they can, they can grab a hold of a manipulative on the screen and use that manipulative to show or to practice what they're learning. You're going to hold them. And that's part of my background. When I first started working with Illuminate about, I guess about four years ago, I was teaching the four to nine-year-olds. Now, four-year-olds, you try to hold a four-year-old's attention for 30 minutes by just talking. Or even just hold a four-year-old's attention by talking and showing pictures. You've got to give them something to play with. So that's where I'm going to come from and that's where I'm going to try to take you. And hopefully by the end you'll say, hey, this would really be a good thing to start adding to what I do with my participants and with my students. 
right, so let's go ahead and take off. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the clip arts, but then we're going to talk about how you could take some of the same ideas and also make prepared slides too that you're not trying to make on the fly. But I want to cover both sides, uh, both sides of it. So here we are, and I and I can, I'll do that if you want. I'll go ahead and do the uh, I can I can do the the forwarding now. Now fast and on the fly is what we're going to talk about when we're talking about the clip art gallery. And then we'll talk about the ones that you could prepare ahead of time. You're not trying to put together. But fast and on the fly is important. Oh, oh. Oh, not that kind of fly. <laughs> Fast on the fly can be important because sometimes right in the middle of your lecture, you suddenly discover that you need things that you didn't anticipate. For instance, especially in an online environment, you're not face to face. Suddenly you've got a student that says, how do I do that on my calculator? Well, if you've got a bunch of calculators already in the background waiting that you can pull in quickly, you can very quickly help your student by bringing up a calculator on screen by, that's just in your clip art gallery. And you can say, OK, in order to do sign, here's what you need to do. And of course, it's helpful if you know some of the major brands. They go about things differently. You have to do things in different keystroke order. But kids often don't know that, especially the first time they're hitting physics, first time they're hitting some of the concepts in the higher mathematics. So what I usually do at the, is at the very beginning of the year, I, I ask the kids to tell me what brands of calculators they have. And if it's one I don't already have them my clip art collection, I'll go online, locate an image, and get it into my, into my clip art gallery. And if I can't find an image of it online, I'll ask them, can you get a picture of it and send it to me? So that's one of the examples that's handy to have on hand. If you're in Illuminate and you need to be able to have some of the things on hand that you can just point to. So in just a second, you'll see this little bit. But having bits and pieces of Illuminate, it can give you some on-screen graphics to point out parts of the online classroom that are difficult to, to direct the student to because it's hard to see uh, with just the pointer going that general direction. And even with, the, even with the, the whiteboard tools, where I'm pointing on my whiteboard, I might be pointing directly to what I see as the pointer tool. But if a student has got a different resolution on their monitor, it won't look like I'm pointing to the pointer tool. But if I could pop on a little screen graphics from my clip art gallery, which is fast to grab, then I can point to exactly what I mean to point to and then generally point to the fact that they're going to find that tool on the side. So that really does help a lot to have bits and pieces of the Illuminate. Okay, some other examples. Let's see. Uh, there are times when you just want to get attention to a particular thing that's happening. So a couple little animated things. Animated things always grab people's attention. So especially on that very first slide, students are arriving. You haven't really officially started classes. You want particular announcements not to be missed. You can pop something like this on the screen real quick and easy from your clip art collection. And I'll be telling you how you can get a hold of some of this stuff so you could have it handy and how you actually make a clip art collection so that you've got it at the ready. Let's see, a couple more examples. Uh, let's see. Let's. There have been a surprising number of times when it's been helpful for me to be able to grab coins with the younger kids. If you have ESL students, especially, you might find it. So even if you don't have elementary math students, um, a collection of money can be really helpful. I find I've, I, especially whenever I was teaching the younger kids, that came up quite a bit. The let's see. Uh, there have been times since I teach the math and sciences, graphs and number lines, that's another collection that I've got handy. A lot of times just right in the middle of a particular topic, I find, you know, if I could demonstrate this on a graph, they would catch this concept a lot better, but I didn't anticipate I would need it when I was making a slide set. But having something handy was great. Oh, OK, well, with the animated GIFs, matter of fact, I've got a slide specifically about that. You can't copy paste animated GIFs in. What you have to do is save them to your hard drive, hard drive and bring them in with the tool that looks like the photograph with the dog-eared corner, and then they animate. So little details like that are easy to not really realize until you've played around with them a good bit. 
But animated animated GIFs are fantastic for a lot of different purposes. One, if you get their attention. But other things that are really helpful and handy would be, if, for instance, teaching the sciences. There's some things you cannot explain with anything but an animation. Oh, for instance, diffusion. They have to see how the molecules bounce against each other and gradually what uh, the substance is spread. And having something animated is fantastic. OK, well, let's move forward. I'm going to actually show you. Oh, here we go. Um, now, I'm also going to go into the prepared engaging activities. These are things you're not just going to make on the fly while the kids are watching. It would take too long to create an interactive like this. But once we get done talking about clip art, I also want to show you that you can take some of the same basic ideas and create interactive activities that your students can do where they actually are grabbing, moving objects around. And you can set it up both as, as a teaching tool but also as assessment tools. Okay, so let's go ahead and for now return to the idea of the clip art gallery. I'm going to give everyone tools. And what I want you to notice is here on the side of the whiteboard screen. Now, this might be specific to Illuminate, but think about the platform that you have. If you have a way to bring in graphics that's pretty quick and easy, you can apply the same basic ideas to that. Now, for everyone in here, though, I thought I would give you a chance to explore the Illuminate clip art gallery so you could be familiar with where I put my clip art. So in the sidebar right here, you'll see a tool set that looks like this. You want the one that looks like a white flag with a red star. Go ahead and click on it, and you'll see a window pop open. And you'll be looking at Illuminate's clip art gallery that comes preloaded. So go ahead and just browse through those tabs and see what all they have. And when you see something that strikes your fancy, go ahead and click on it, and then click the word place, and put it right here on the screen. At first, it'll look like you're carrying it around. But if you click your, button, your mouse button, you'll find that you can put it right down. There you go. Now you can see how we're in a live setting where you've got students. If you suddenly realized you needed something, if you just had a customized clip art gallery as one of those tabs in there, you could grab little bits and pieces of things that you might need for your subject area or your topic. So it doesn't take very long to grab it, but you can have them at the ready. OK, now I'm going to, hopefully everyone's got a chance to place at least one and explore those tabs at least a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead, let me see, do you see some icons up there you don't have? Did you get a chance to click on the tabs? There's a bunch of tabs at the top. It usually comes up by default to the general, which is very, very uh, graphical, picture-oriented stuff. But there are other tabs up along the top that will take you to areas that have Greek uppercase and lowercase letters, mathematical symbols. Believe me, that's a big help whenever it comes to math and science teachers to have some of those that they can grab up really quick. OK, now hopefully everyone's had a chance to kind of get a peek. You don't see tabs. Mm, let's see. Did you see the gener general ones where you've got the, the, the pictures and you're clicking the white flag with the red star? That's right here in the sidebar. Hmm, but no tabs up along the top of it. I'm going to open mine up real quick. I'm going to grab a screenshot. Now, mine's going to look a little different because I've got a custom set that I'm using today. But just to make sure, there we go. And let me close it. I'm going to bring in a big image here. Hold on a second. We'll get it on. All right, here's. OK, it's streaming to everybody. Everybody be able to see it in just a moment. OK, most everybody's seeing it now. OK, when everybody's talk about tabs, here they are at the top. Now, my, I've got custom tabs, so my tabs will look different than yours. You can make all kinds of custom sets and set them up in any particular subcategory that you want to have. And you can even turn off the default ones if you have no use on a, at a particular time for the math symbols or the Greek uppercase and lowercase centers, uh, lowercase letters, you can actually turn off those tabs so it doesn't get cluttered. But for whatever your purpose is, you can control what tabs you see. Add bars. OK, could you click on them up along the top? Oh, 
Okay. See what at the end I'll show you some of the other tools. I'll show you how to do the pointers. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and quiet the tools. And you'll find all of your tools will disappear for just a little bit. Can I move on to the next slide? Hold on a second. I've got to get it to respond. There we go. Okay. Now, again, here's an example. This even has more right here. I've got it narrowed down to just what I need today, but you could actually see a larger set. Now, one thing to know about Illuminate, at least, when it comes to having your custom clip art tabs, it's going to be computer specific. So if you work on several computers and you create a custom clip art collection, you want to make sure that that custom clip art collection is loaded on each of the computers that you're on. Also, when you load custom collections into the Illuminate clip art, it's only for you. The, the other students won't see it. So if it's important for other students to have access to the clip art for whatever reason, you can also basically walk them through, share the file, walk them through how to install it. It's not really that hard. Then they would have it available to them if you found that it was needed. I, I've been teaching all kinds of different courses. I haven't really found it to be a requirement that the students have any custom sets. But as a teacher, it's really helpful. Okay, now let me go ahead and I'll just kind of I'll, I'll show you some of the various things that I have. And it could start getting the creative juices going for what kind of things that you would find helpful to have. Now I showed one little bit from my Illuminate bits and pieces. But if you teach in Illuminate, hold on a second, let me get over to that set. If you teach in Illuminate, having things like, oh, the top toolbar area, and this one right here and the view that you're seeing right now, that's the student view. But there are times whenever I'm working with moderators, too. So I also have what the top toolbar looks like from a moderator's perspective. So it's helpful for me if I'm in the middle of a presentation, all of a sudden somebody says, I can't remember how to do that. How do I do that? I can pop this up on the screen. Some other lit little bits and pieces that is helpful whenever you're actually using Illuminate would be showing people how to actually go into the audio setup wizard. So it's kind of nice to, if I if right in the middle of a, of a presentation, someone's audio, they just come in a little bit late, but they need help setting their audio up, I can, I can stop for just a little brief second, show them how to do it. Um, just to make a little bit of room, I'm going to scoot these off the side and show you some of the other ones. And this, this set, if you're interested in it, if you're teaching with Illuminate, you might definitely find it interesting. Um, I've actually got this set all put together and I share it at Learn Central. So you can, don't even have to put your own together, make your own. Um, this particular one is how to do direct chat. So it's nice to be able to have something you put up on screen at any point during the lecture and show how to do directed chat. Let's get this in and out of the way too. And everything that you see here is, is in that set. And you saw this one earlier. You see how helpful it can be to, to pull that up. And let's see. Whenever you, if you need to set the classroom to roam, it's nice to be able to have the corner so you can show them how to move through the slide sets. Okay. Now, I won't show you everything I've got in mind, but there's actually a couple more images. But you can see if you're actually teaching in Illuminate, you probably have already experienced, man, if I just had a real quick image that I could pop up on the screen, because I'm pointing as best I can to where the student needs to do something, but they can't really tell where I'm pointing to. So this is really, really helpful. Okay, and then the, how about for your students? If you start having interactive activities, you may find that you'll come to a place where you want to be able to have individual interactive slides, but you need to be able to pop their names onto there. And it could take a lot of time to, to type in everybody's name on each individual slide. Or sometimes a student might be talking and it's just kind of nice for the students to get to see a real quick picture of them. To, to just get a feel in your mind of what this person looks like. So what I do is with my students is I create, when we first start up, I create little name tags. And then whenever the time pops up, it just seems like it would be a perfect opportunity to bring these up. Either it's an activity. Sometimes we do, we do games where the kids break up into teams. I can bring these up and I can group these into their teams. And then they could tell who's on their teams. There we go. 
And so this is really helpful to have real quick and handy. Now, you don't have to go with their pictures. If you've got a group of kids in which you feel like, OK, they might be uncomfortable with their pictures being up there, well, you can have little name plaques. As long as your student, student body kind of stays the same, you can, you can make your plaques up ahead of time. And, but I, I recommend, if you can, if, especially if the kids aren't ever meeting face to face, they're scattered out throughout the country, and that's what I have. We've, we've got kids from Brazil, Canada, Hawaii, all the, the continental United States, all over the place. So they don't get a chance to see each other face to face, and this helps to give them that connection. Karen, can I interrupt just for a second because there's a question in the chat room? Absolutely. Um, do, you do you put the uh -huh. children's uh, images into a special clip art tab? Is that how you organized it? Uh huh. Okay. Exactly. What I do is I is I have the student. In in our case, our stu our our group has a Ning, and I just grab up the images that they put in their Ning. And if the image that they have in their Ning isn't a picture of them, like I've got one student who has the gecko, the the Geico gecko, as his avatar. So I'll contact him. I said, Do you want a picture of yourself? to share with these online things, or, or would you rather have a picture of the gecko? So every once in a while, we'll get one that they would prefer to have a, an avatar. Maybe they're uncomfortable with the way they look, and that's OK. It, it still allows them, because in the Ning, they know that person from that, that avatar, and they still make a good connection, even if they don't know what that person looks like. But what I do is I just, it's really simple. Matter of fact, I created these right in Illuminate. I just grabbed some pictures of the kids, sized them down, put a little square around it, popped their first name in, and then took a screenshot of it, and then added them in the clip art. And I'm going to show you how to actually add them to a clip art tab in just a little bit. But I wanted to make sure you had ideas of, well, what would I use it for? And we've talked a little bit about the animated attention getters. And that's where you can bring a lot of movement. and. Let me get over to that set. You can bring in all sorts of things. Now, of course, when it comes to animations, you can easily overdo it. It's just like with PowerPoint. You can, PowerPoint's great because it does have animations and it has transitions, but you can easily overdo it and then have it so busy that students can't concentrate. But adding a little something here and there, like a spice, it's kind of nice to have that. So I've got a little clip art collection that's specifically for animations. And of course, this one here, you pull up a lot during Christmas time, <laughs> make it nice and festive. Uh, during the 4th of July, you might want to have fireworks just, just to help celebrate certain holidays. OK, and for money, the clip art gallery that you might have for money, it could be useful, of course, if you're working with elementary students because they're going to be learning those skills. But I have bills and coins, and I don't use it as much as I used to use it because I used to work with the four to nine year olds and I taught the mathematics as one of the things that I worked with, so I had to bring it up a lot. But it's not just for the mathematics, it could help with ESL. And even the languages, uh, if you've got a group where um, you're teaching in another country, you could have the coins of that country, for instance, that you're teaching French. You could have French coins and bills and then allow them to practice by what they see. You could point to it and have the students say it. Or you can say it and have the students point to it. OK, now, um, math tools. This is going to be great for those math and science teachers among the group. And because I tend, to, I've here the last couple of years, I've been doing the math and the, uh, the math and the science, I find some tools are just incredibly useful. Things like protractors. And just to show you that you can actually see through it, I'm going to actually pull this out and lock it to the background. And you can see how you could use a protractor to measure something on screen in the background. And other things that are really helpful, and I've already shown you the calculator idea and the graph idea. Um, but if you are a math and science teacher, being able to pull a graph up and then either draw a ride on it or perhaps bring up a parent function. Let's see if I've got my parent functions loaded. There we are can be really helpful. And then you can resize and place it. You could show them how when you change certain things, it moves it around. So by having it loaded up where you can get to it quickly, you can respond to your students instantly. As soon as they have a concept problem you didn't originally anticipate and built into the slide, you can, you can just at the drop of a hat be able to respond to what they're going to need. Let's see, context groups from different countries using Illuminate. 
Okay, yeah. Um, it's just whoever comes to us. We actually, the, pro, the, the group that I work with is entirely nonprofit. I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid. I spend anywhere from 40 to 60 hours a week teaching, preparing, training other volunteers. And we get people from all over. We've even had people from uh, New Zealand and Australia interested in trying to do it. Time zones are a little bit tough. Um, but I've been trying to encourage those that contact us from, uh, from the Eastern Hemisphere to say, you know, there's no reason why we can't have, you know, a, a second session and have something running. But because I have to get sleep at night, somebody would have to take charge and, and be able to run with it. And so far, no one's quite been willing, especially when it's all volunteer, nobody gets paid. <laughs> so let's see. What board? Is there a grid that can be on the, oh, to the background? Yep. Actually, whenever we, whenever we get to a section that shows you how to make the prepared ones, not so much the clip art ones, but how to prepare one that's designed before the kids even arrive, it's already made for them to interact with, we'll talk about how you can lock stuff down to the background. There you go, yeah. And statistics, anytime that you can bring in something that can show statistics, definitely when in statistics you're, you're trying to show how the data relates to the mathematical function. Yeah, and everything that you, almost everything that you're seeing me pop on the screen here, I'm able to share and I've got it at Learn Central. All you have to do is just go to my member page and look in my uh, portfolio and you can download these clip art questions. The only ones I, I can't share are ones that I can't share because of copyright issues. For instance, let me go back to this one. These right here, now I got these and they're, they're free to use but the particular um, license that they're under, you can use them personally and you can use them in, in presentations like teaching. You could do it in teaching. But you can't have them in other clip art collections. And I thought, well, if I were to share my clip art collection, that might be considered sharing it in other clip art. So I can't do my animated attention getters, but it's really easy. I just I browsed around the internet. I just typed in uh, uh, animated arrows. I typed in animated welcome and found the sites that had the free clip art and then I could just bring it in. I wish I could share it with you, but again, that's, I just have, I have to make sure I don't get myself into trouble. But it took all of maybe 20 minutes to, to gather up quite a few animated uh, images to have handy. Okay, let me get back up where we were. Okay, science lab equipment. Now, here's where, here's where my heart is. I'm teaching the high school science and I love it. I absolutely adore teaching the sciences. I do biology and chemistry and physics. So, of course, if you're going to teach a topic like that and you're very graphics oriented and you want to have a lot of interaction, what I've got in my clip art gallery is I've got a lab table. So, hold on a second and I'll pull it out. Let me get it sized. There we go. And I have in my clip art collection an entire laboratory worth of stuff. So I can just lock down my lab desk that I pulled from my clip art collection. And if I just needed to demonstrate how a particular lab is done, I could pull out my, in, my little bits and pieces. So, and I could decide how big or how small I want that particular object to be by resizing it. We'll talk about that a little bit. And I could pull in, I see I've got some blank bottles. So if I need a chemical, I could just put a label on it. Now, not only is this useful for instructive purposes, but it's also useful to test the students to see if they understand the labs because they too can handle the lab equipment and they can demonstrate for me, well, how do you set it up? I can actually even have one slide that's a stock room where they have to show me, okay, what are you going to need? And they select what they need from the stock room. Um, and then, uh, Oh, and another thing I, want, I thought I would point out too is shadows. You can make it more realistic if you give it a shadow. So you see that little circle there? That's my shadow. So I can actually, let me add in another object here. I can ground my objects just to make them look a little bit more realistic if I want to. So I'm going to bring in a vinegar bottle. And I can arrange things so that the shadow looks like it's anchoring that vinegar bottle a little bit. There you go. And if you want, yeah, but see, this, this clip art collection is made and you can download too. And you'd be surprised if, for instance, um, a lot of times there are locations on the internet where artists gather together just because they love to do art. A lot of times you can go to those places such as Wet Canvas 
and go to the digital art. Uh, they've got a, they've got them all broken up by themes, but go to the one for digital art and say, hey, I'm a teacher, and I need a particular object. Here's a picture of it, but I need it to be clear. For instance, let's say you found a photograph of a. You you want to have. Let me put this up here so you can see it. Um, you want to have it to where you've got a beaker, but you can see through it. And whenever you find clip art, get clip art on the internet, it looks so solid you can't see through it. Well, then go to Wet Canvas, go into the digital artist group that they have as a subgroup in there, and say, I really need to be able to kind of have it look like real glass so that I could see through it. Can anybody help me? And you can get help there. Plus, uh, you're going to find out in a little bit too. I've got some slides that I've started a group at Learn Central where uh, we can get together uh, each Saturday. So if you've got a need and you don't have the technical know-how or the tools to do it, just kind of get involved with that Saturday group or just post in the thread. There's, it has a forum in it. So even if you can't show up on Saturday, just let us know that you have a need for something. And um, at least for me, I've, I've got a background in illustration. And if I've got some time, I might be able to create something for you. And I'm sure as time goes by, we'll, we'll have a good many members that probably do have some skills that you might lack. So we can collaborate. We can help each other out. OK, so let me go ahead and move on now. I showed you some example of how I use my clip art gallery with my science. Now, other things that might be helpful are concept maps. If you've got a class in which there you can, you're building constantly. On there you go. Somebody's somebody sharing some clip art for chemistry, and there are cl there's clip out clip art all over the internet. Believe me, it's not hard at all to find clip art. You do have to be kind of careful that you can check what the license is. If you're, for instance, teaching a class that uh, would be classified as commercial, for instance, if you're a tutor making money off it, you have to be careful because of copyright. Sometimes if you're making money off of it, the nonprofit types of licenses won't apply. So do be careful, but that's an entirely different topic when we're talking about the licenses. But for the most part, Teachers are going to find that most of the clip art that they find, they're going to, they're going to do great on getting it. Um, this one here, I teach chemistry. And one interesting thing about chemistry is I've got this is in my clip art gallery because we use it every single module just about because everything comes back to moles. The kids consider me a broken record on that little phrase. And throughout the various chapters and modules, they're taught how to convert grams to, to uh, moles and molarity to moles. Anybody who's in here with chemistry, you, you probably know all about that. But it's not something that's just in one module. About 9 out of 16 modules is actually building this concept map. So as we go through, I can add on the little bits, and they can see the big picture of chemistry, because the big picture of chemistry can be summarized right here. Now, there's a couple of concepts that wouldn't be included here, but the majority of the stoichiometry is all summarized on this simple little map. And whenever we're doing problems together, and I have my students uh, trying to figure out how do they get from, from what the problem is giving them to where they have to go, we actually use this map. We'll look at what they're given, and we'll make our way all the way through. And they have to actually plot their path to get from what they're given to what they have to find. And it really strengthens their understanding the big picture. So in your subject area, even if you, know, you don't teach chemistry, you may find that being able to have key concept maps handy that you can pop on the screen to be really helpful so your students never really lose track with the big picture while they're concentrating on the, the details. OK, now I thought this would be a good time to, to slow down just a bit and find out what you think you could use. So think about what the subject that you have, the, the participants or the students that you have. And, and not even always just the thing I've already mentioned, brainstorm. How could you utilize images that you can pull up on the fly or images that you could use and stuff that you just go ahead and make and have ready before your students arrive? So brainstorming time. Go ahead and use the text chat box. And see if you can either either comment that something you've seen would be useful, or um, just think about how it might apply to yours. And while you're typing in, I'll, I'll start sharing some of the some of the extensions that that I could think of. Let's say you teach creative writing. You can have slides in which you've got multiple slides, but the kids can move through the slides and select bits and pieces of their setting. You can have a couple of backgrounds with different moods. 
and then they could select objects to put in. All they have to do in Illuminate is just use the copy paste to, to actually put their sets together. And this could be useful when you're teaching setting. What elements make something have a scary mood? And you could have sets for that. And then they could start drawing their own stuff in too. But there's where it can apply to creative writing. You might think, well, how in the world can I do anything graphical and have it relate to creative writing? Well, there's one. Even characters. You can have bits and pieces of body parts and help them as they're thinking through what kind of physical traits would my character have to get across that they're a certain type of person. And then let them assemble it visually and then turn around and let them figure out how, how do you describe that in words. And then you go online history classes. There you go, screenshots of the Moodle tools. There's a fantastic thing to have handy. And definitely clipart would be helpful for that. Because you, you might have somebody right in the middle of, of something, doing something entirely different, say, I can't figure out how to do this in Moodle. And being able to pull it up fast is really great. Um, also for history, if you do paper doll sets, now you might be going, oh, I've got teenagers. They won't go for paper doll sets. You'd be surprised. You can have a basic character with, obviously, proper things covered. But then you can have clothing from different periods. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet where you can do paper doll sets. There's a lot of them that were created way back in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s that are now out of copyright. And people are sharing them on the internet. And um, I don't know if I'll have time to demonstrate here how to use the GIMP, but I'll show, you, I'll, I'll show you how you can get that information. And so for history, you can have one key character, or a couple of key characters, and then clothing and scenes and settings that you can just pull together and use. And, and the kids will have fun with it. They can set up their scenes or just for you in your presentations. You can have just to help you with your presentations if you've got a whole group of different period clothing. And then you've got almost instant characters. Um, yeah, matter of fact, if, I don't think we're going to have time for the GIMP, but I'll share you the site that I'll share one of the sites that I that I've come across. But just a quick search will help you to find the history sites that have paper doll sets. Okay, and I'm starting to run a little tight on time. Um, so, and what I definitely need to make sure that we get into, at least for those of you that are doing Illuminate, is how do you make a custom collection so that you've got the stuff you need on the fly. Now, some stuff you won't ever need to be able to grab up and pop on the screen unexpectedly. But for those things that you think will be in that category, here's how you do it in Illuminate. What you do is you go under Tools. And if you want to go take a look at it while I'm showing you, feel free to. Just go on up, look where it says Tools in the top toolbar. Go down to where it says Whiteboard. When you hover over Whiteboard, this screen will pop open. And you'll see that there's an option for clip art collections. So feel free to go ahead and click on it, because you can always move the window a little bit off to the side so you can still see the screen. OK, after you click on that, you'll see a window pop open. And it'll say Clip Art Collections at the top. The very first image that you have here, I have it circled in red, and it's coded to this red here. That's for you to create and modify a collection. And then if you've got a collection that's on your hard drive already and you want to just load it in. For instance, if you go to my member page at Learn Central and download Illuminate Bits and Pieces clip art collection or any of the other clip art collections I've got, you can just download it to your hard drive and use this just to load it in. And then when you load it in, you'll see it pop up in a little section down here. And this is also where you can turn off what you don't need. They'll all always stay loaded up unless you specifically trash them. And you can trash them. Uh, for instance, I had the old version of Illuminate Bits and Pieces and don't need it anymore. So I just highlighted it and clicked. And that made the trash icon active. And I just trashed it. And then I replaced it with the new Illuminate Bits and Pieces. But if you don't want to see everything in your tabs, just deselect it. So for today, for instance, I didn't want all my tabs to be open, so I wanted it fast for me to be able to find what I needed. So I actually turned off all of the default palettes for me today. OK, so you can even control what tabs show up. OK, now let's get into how do you create or modify a collection. So assuming that you don't already have one you're loading in, you need to create one from scratch, click the very first one. What you'll see is a, it'll look kind of blank at first. But if you're going to create a new clip art collection, click on this one. And if you just want to add some new image to a current collection, you would click on this one. Let's see, are the clip art collections added to Illuminate by the user or by the computer? 
Um, not quite sure. Oh, you would create your Im you would create or find your clip art, and then have them on your hard drive. And then, yeah, you wouldn't even need if um. See, I need your background on Illuminate. Do you have a VRoom or do you teach using Illuminate? You can go into any particular source, whether it's your VRoom or if it's your classroom. Okay, V class. Just log on in, go through these particular steps, and assuming you've already got your images located on your hard drive, then all you have to do is just create a new just click on this one to create a new clip art gallery. Assuming you're making a new one and not just loading a pre made one. Oops, I went one, one slide too many. And in this instance, let's say that you're right in the middle, of, you're just getting started creating your own collection of animated GIF attention getters. Well, if you had this, this, the flashing lights for the, the Christmas string of lights, then simply navigate to them in your, uh, you click on this little symbol here, it'll open up a window, let you navigate to it. And then when you click it, it adds it right into the collection. And then you just keep clicking to add the images until you're satisfied with the whole collection. Click OK. And then it'll ask you where you want to save it to. And just navigate to where you want it to save. And then click Save. It'll save as a jar file, which basically allows all the images to be in one file. Let's see, if you change computers, yeah. The, at least when it comes to Illuminate, it's computer specific. So let's say you're regularly switching between your laptop and desktop when you're teaching. You want to load the clip art collection on each of them so that they'll be available on each of them. So all you have to do is just get your, get your jar file that you create whenever you're at this step here. You hit save, it'll create that jar file. Just send the jar file over to your other system and then just load your jar file in. You don't have to start from scratch and create it. Once you create it once, you could just use your, your finished clip art collection jar file and make a copy of it and put it on your other computer. And that's what, that's what we're going to cover in just a little bit. And actually, the file type, the PNG, uh, GIF, and JPEG, there's advantages and disadvantages to each, and we're going to talk about that one. Yeah, exactly. You can put them on a thumb drive, but you do still have to let your computer know to look there. So when you start Illuminate, basically it's part of the startup process of Illuminate. It looks to see what custom clip art you have. So it has to know where to look. But you can always add it in on the fly, too. But it's better if you can, if you can already have it in place instead of having to load it fresh every time. Mm -hmm. OK, and let's see. So you, here's where you would save the finished clip art cl collection. Now, when it, I know that not everybody's great at art. I come from an illustration background, and gradually I've, I've gone from learning traditional tools to the computer-based tools. And not everybody has that. So I wanted to make sure that we had a way for people to get together and collaborate with clip art collections, and also to collaborate with creating interactive slides, which is what we're going to talk about next. If I've got enough time, I'm going to have to hurry. But join in at Learn Central, and you don't have to be just an Illuminate user, even though Illuminate sponsors it. Um, it's for teachers that teach anything, use any particular platform, or those that don't use any particular platform. Um, and that's a great place to go. If you go and do a resource search, click in Illuminate Clip Art, and it'll bring up all the clip art collections I've shared. And I'm going to encourage everybody else that's making clip art collection, if they use the same term, then one search term will bring up everything. I, actually, what I'm going to do is I've created a group, and um, that group is there at Learn Central. You can join in, and we're going to get together every Saturday and collaborate. And in fact, I'm going to share that on the screen if I can grab it. Okay, hold on a minute, and I'll pop it on the screen. And then I'll also, okay, if you join up at Learn Central and go to the group section, look for the group that has this blue, uh, this blue board on it and join into it. And every Saturday, we're going to get together and help each other with their graphical needs for creating interactive activities and clip art. So feel free to jump on in and join on in. It'll be 2 o'clock Central, and you have to convert that to your own time zone. But the, the group website actually will give it to you in your own time zone once you join in. Um, and we'll get together. We'll start off with a planned four weeks. Next week, we'll talk about how, to use, how you can use GIMP. And that's one of the things that's really helpful. Um, how you can use GIMP to, to modify your clip art.
but I'm running out of time and I've got to go fast. So if you like this idea and you want to start building a collection, you feel like you need a little more, a little more help and you want to actually collaborate with teams, find some other people in chemistry or whatever subject you teach that you can work together with, that's going to be a great place. So uh, let me go ahead now, because I'm running out of time, uh, to, for the prepared engage activities. For instance, this right here you couldn't just make by on the fly for the kids. You'd want this stuff to be ready. So I want to show you also how you can have stuff and make stuff and have interactivity to your sessions. I started off by teaching the four to nine year olds in the online classroom. And to grab and hold their attention, you had to really, from the very get go, keep them constantly doing stuff. So everything had to be very interactive and very game-like. So I'm going to show you some of the things that we had. I taught phonics as one of the classes. And this particular one, could I can make multiple slides, assign each student to each of their own slides, set it to them so they can go to their own slides. And they would have a picture deck. And this is a lot like, oh, what is it, Boggle? Not Boggle. Uh, Boggle Junior, I think it is. And they've got a little card prompting them as to what word they're supposed to spell. And this obviously is going to be for the early spellers. They could actually pick up these little letters down here, put them in place, and I could see if they, if they make a mistake. I'm going to put, make a mistake on this one. Then they can move the little blue cover as a self-check. And they say, oh, oh, not A. And they'll put their A back. And they'll put their U up there and say, OK, cup. And then they could put the blue cover back on and move to the next card. And then they can, this is a great way for you to be able to interact one-on-one -on -one with students. Because when you've got multiple students working on this, you can move through, at least in Illuminate, you can move through and watch everybody. You can go from slide to slide and slide, seeing how the students are doing. And when you see one mess up, the other ones are nice and busy with their own slide. And you can be on the mic with the one that's having trouble and say, OK, no, it wasn't cap. And let's say they couldn't figure out they needed the U then you can verbally walk them through. But the other kids aren't sitting back bored silly. They're busy working through their deck while you're helping that one out. Uh -huh. That's also at Learn Central. If you look in my portfolio, this particular game is there. It's called the spelling game. And, and you can see how, and, and I like making games for the kids because they usually after about 30 minutes with the youngest kids, they would get pretty tired. So the last, the last 15 minutes to half an hour, we would let them do games, but the games also taught them things. For instance, this was with the math kids. And to them, they were just playing Battleship. But for me, they were learning a lot about coordinate positioning. And in, the, in this instance with Battleship, you'd have the two players playing. When there's a miss, they would pick up the miss and they would put the miss down. And if they had a hit, then they could do a hit. And the kids loved it because they can pick up and move stuff around. They, they adore this. It's just as if they're in the same room together playing Battleship. Of course, they have to use a scrap sheet of paper to figure out where to hide their ships. <laughs> so having it interactive is very, very engaging. When they can pick stuff up, move stuff around, and it doesn't always have to be where everyone has their own slides or, or the kids are all grabbing stuff and moving stuff around. You can do just as well with text chat games. For instance, this is actually a set that I use with my younger kids. These are even the students that I had. And for about two or three months, they loved this game so much they always wanted to end with this one. And so each of them had their own frog. And let's just, let's just pretend you're a student. And and what you would do is I would, I would, I won't turn off the text chat, but for the students, I would turn off the text chat so that only I could see their answers. They couldn't see each other's answers. And then what I would do is I would tell them, pick a fly. And then they would type in the coordinate. And they would have been taught, OK, you have to do your x axis first and then your y axis. So I would have it turned off so they can't see each other's answers. So how about you just play along with me? Pick a fly and give me a coordinate, doing x-axis, and then a comma, and then the y-axis. OK, now I've got it set so everybody could see each other's. But for if, with a student in the class, I would go to their particular frog. And the kids always thought this was hilarious. And I would draw the tongue. And they would get a point if they happened to give me a, a coordinate point to actually hit a fly. If they hit an empty spot, then they wouldn't get a point. And we did breakfast, lunch, dinner, oh, and snack in there too. And so they would even tell me, OK, what, what are we going to serve for lunch? And they would do stuff like French flies. They thought that was hilarious, trying to decide what in the world that they wanted to have. And I would get goofy sometimes by using odd colors. 
and you know doing crazy stuff like a tongue that was like that. They would just giggle and laugh, and I thought that was super. And this game lasted easily a couple a couple of months before they finally got tired of it. And we always ended it. And at the very end, I would give them the tools, and they would, which I would say, okay, um, now our frogs are nicely fed. Now it's time to put them to bed. And they would actually, I'd give them all tools, and they would they would create little blankets for their frogs. And I'd say, OK, do I hear them sleeping yet? And they'd start snoring and doing ribbits. And then that would be how we ended the day. And it was very friendly. They loved that tradition. OK, let me go ahead and show you a couple other ones that is helpful before I run completely out of time. Um, pointer games are great. I'm going to go ahead and give everybody tools. And if you could pretend you're students, I'm not so much I'm showing you the different types of games you could do. Right now, what I want you to do is grab up your pointer tools. And I'm going to bring up my little clip art gallery to show you exactly where it is for those that might not know. Okay, Everyone has tools. And in the toolbar right off here on this side, you want the one that's the blue one with the red pom-pom. Go ahead and select that from the toolbar right over here. And we should see a bunch of pointers pop up on the screen. There we go. Now we're starting to do it. Now here's the progression I usually did with my younger kids especially, but even teen, teens are sensitive to this. A lot of times you, the students don't want to make a mistake in front of their peers. It's very embarrassing. But pointer to tools are nice because nobody knows whose pointer is whose. And at the very beginning of teaching something, if they make a mistake, they don't get embarrassed. So if I were to call out which shape is the pentagon, and I'd already taught you about it, then see, I could quiz, at least get a feel for the whole classroom by seeing how many of the pointers locked onto the correct place. Now, sure, a lot of the students would move their pointer because they might not know, but they saw everybody else go there. But when all I need is just a basic feel for how are the students doing, this is terrific. And it's low pressure for the kids. Now, the next step up would be drag and drop ones. Now, we can't all do this because I don't have quite enough names. But what you would do with this one is instead of using the pointer tool like we had here, we would be using the selector tool. And I would have the students drag and drop their name. Now, here's where this is geared up a little bit. Now it's going to be assessment oriented. Now I actually know who put what down. They still could look at what everybody else voted and put theirs there. But now I know who put what where. So now I've got a little more specific individual information. Then at the next step up, then I can have a slide in which they've got, it's just their own slide. And I can set the room to roam. All the students go to their own slide. And then they're doing their interactive activity. For instance, if I'd been teaching money skills, I could have all of them on their own particular slide. This would be Abby's slide. And while Abby's working on how to put out $1.52 to make a purchase, then I could be going through and seeing if anybody's struggling and then give them some help. So you, you saw it go from low stress Nobody knows who made a mistake. Now all the way up to the highest level of accountability. And you could even set your students up in individual breakout rooms so they can't even peek at each other's slides. So Jerome, that's another thing I'm hoping, I was hoping to get to, but we're already five minutes right. over. And I think I'm, I'm, they're going to want to end the recording. That was going to be my next thing I was going to talk about roaming. But maybe after the official session's done, um, for those that want to stick around, I'll show you all, right. all kinds of little things to help you. Like how we could go into how to do roaming and stuff. So I'll, I'll be quiet. Thank you very now. much. <laughs> we run into one technical difficulty. We lost Kim because your uh, laptop battery quit. My computer just hopped up and the fan's kicking in. So I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that we're not not going to lose you. Um, I, and I know we do have to end, end this session in the next five minutes. Um, even after the class, I'm sorry, I can't accommodate that today. But I'm going to suggest, Tammy, as you trying to get this into your Saturday morning sessions, because I know people were really excited to have all kinds of questions for you. Uh, would that be possible for us to do the last part of this presentation there? Absolutely. I've already got it scheduled in the Learn Central uh, main online classroom, so we'll have plenty of room. We have the ability to record. So even if you can't make it, it's 2 o'clock Central. Like I said, join Learn Central. Look for that group. Or just if nothing else, if you can't figure out the group, yeah, I had all kinds of stuff more. I had way more content okay. to give you than what I had time for. And uh, But we'll pick up. And on next Tuesday, those who want to really get hands on and really delve into this, welcome. you're welcome to show up. And remember, I'm at Learn Central. Look for Tammy Moore. So if you had any questions, you can easily get a hold of me.
Thanks very much, Tammy. Now, I'm not used to closing down. This is all Kim's expertise, so I'm going to drop in the in the chat room there the link to the survey. So we really would like it if you could complete the survey. It helps us um, evaluate or set our direction in our shows, and it also helps to illuminate to evaluate what's going on with the, the software. And I, I think already we've seen some uh, changes to the software because of the different comments. Uh, let's uh, again thank very much uh, Tammy for her work today. It was phenomenal. And I'm so sorry we've run out of time. Steve Hargadon for, as we know, the founder of uh, Classroom 2.0 and Future of Education for his work in keeping this going. And thanks for all the good ideas in the chat room. Uh, it's great to have the questions too. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. And our Oh, before I do that, we need to talk again about future of education. I don't know if we have a session set up for next week, but if we not, we don't. Here we go. I haven't even looked at that. We have an interview of with authors of Liberating Learning Technology, Politics, and the Future of American Education. I know that uh, Steve does send out reminder notices for the different sessions, and as well as in Learn Central. Uh, I know that uh, on the calendar there are posted the different interviews in advance for the future of education. So coming soon, uh, some of the people he'll be bringing is uh, John C. Lee Brown, David Thornburg, Clay Shirky, Douglas Rushkoff, as well as sessions on School 2.0, school two zero, Homeschool 2.0, student-generated e-portfolios, and the education, I don't know what EU stands for, sorry, Classroom Collaboration Program in E20. So stay tuned for dates and times. And thank you again for all your work, Tammy, you do with closed captioning. I know you're going to be back with us next week doing the same thing. And I don't have the last slide that talks about our upcoming guest, who is Chris Binho. And he'll be, um, forgive me, everybody, I don't have the information here to help you. But um, over the week, you'll be able to go to our archives and to our main page, which is liveclassroom.20, to um, get the information on our, on our next guest. And I know you've been faithful being with us. I've seen some names in the chat room uh, over and over. And I'm glad to have all those Canadians with me today. Thanks for attending for everyone. And uh, across the world, I hope you're making great connections. Thank you very much, everyone, Tammy especially. Have a great Saturday. Sorry, Tammy, we just have to um, carry forth there.